Yeah, thank you, Professor Kakas Samantha. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to thank Krishnendu and Abhishek to organize this lecture. Uh, in many mathematical workshops that we conducted previously, we used to have a special uh, some lectures on unity of mathematics, by which, which it was meant that uh, some two or three different branches of mathematics uh, were brought together. Uh, this is a similar type of lecture. Here, uh, I'm just trying to uh, try to bring together mathematics and chemistry. Yeah, Professor Semanta has already mentioned about the C60. In fact, one of my students in the United States had done uh, a master's thesis uh, on that C60 from a mathematical perspective. Uh, uh, this topic of periodic table is really a very exciting topic. I've been interested in this topic from my college days. It is exciting to see how the data accumulated over centuries, and particularly last two, three centuries, about what we call matter. This is a really human thought category, what we call matter how it gets explained by bringing together different viewpoints, and particularly how mathematics plays a role in bringing these viewpoints together. Uh, I think this is fortunately a, a gift of Corona, is that we were forced to start these web seminars. Uh, it's not as good as meeting together, uh, meeting in person, uh, but uh, it, has, uh, a, it has really a great potential that uh, once we get familiar with these web seminars, uh, I think we can really promote mathematics and other sciences in ways we never thought about 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, I must ask for indulgence. I have, uh, given, I'm giving this talk for the second time. I added considerably for this talk, uh, and I just put the two slides together, so there will be some, uh, some, uh, some repetition. Uh, okay, so I begin my talk. Uh, this Mendeley's periodic table, it was done in 18, uh, he published that in 1869, and its 150th anniversary, was celebrated last year all over the world. It set the foundation of all natural science, which includes physics, chemistry, biology, medicine. Among these sciences, physics and chemistry deal entirely with matter. But the understanding of matter gained in modern physics and chemistry through atomic theory has applications in biology and medicine. However, in biology and more so in medicine, consciousness, consciousness, that's another thought category, human thought category, also starts playing a fundamental role. But in this talk, I shall mostly restrict to physics and chemistry and the study of matter. Now, what is the role of uh, mathematics in this development? Many physicists, for example, the Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner, he wrote a long paper in 1960s, and he wondered unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics. But to discuss meaningfully the role of mathematics in the sciences, we need to fix some workable definitions of the terms used. And there are really underlying philosophical issues which we need to understand. Before we talk about the role of mathematics, let's first see in the 21st century what we understand by the term matter. This understanding has evolved uh, through the, over the centuries. So assume for the moment that we know what is matter. Uh, uh, yeah, nobody can question us about uh, what we know about matter. Uh, we agree that both chemistry and physics deal with matter. But what is the difference in their approaches? 
modern chemistry understands matter through atoms molecules compounds mixtures but it studies uh, 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 these things in their pure form modern physics builds on this understanding and study studies further their motion now once we start talking about motion this notion of motion implicitly involves two more notions a three dimensional space of our physical experience and time these are really again belong to the uh, our thought categories now the study of motion is at two levels one is macroscopic and the second is microscopic this macroscopic study involves motion of large bodies which we experience in daily life a grain of sand is a large body for this purpose and of course the stone mountains rivers planets which have sizes of the order of more than a few centimeters now this part was largely explained by newton's theory of gravitation by contrast the microscopic study involves motion of small bodies like atoms electrons protons neutrons we do not see these objects through our naked eyes but then how do we know the whether they even exist even their existence is surmised from a certain widely accepted theory by now and all this theorizing is mathematical for example now uh, you certainly learn now in chemistry courses that the hydrogen atom uh, it is really mathematically modeled on a small ball of radius 10 to the minus 10 meters all these measurements like length area volume weight time involve numbers this number is one category of mathematical thought these measurements are not material objects themselves but they are number valued functions on sets of objects at the micro at the macroscopic level the functions attached to sets of objects for example length area volume weight take values only in positive numbers but at the microscopic level there arises a new phenomenon called electric charge the charge comes in two types and again these two types are very conveniently modeled on positive and negative numbers you know the simpler example of this the convex and concave lenses the study of that in physics their mathematics just involves the same equation but uh, at some point we allow the uh, negative values for the parameters and they explain the concave lenses and the con convex lenses is uh, explained by the positive numbers now as was said earlier the study of motion also involves the notions of three dimensional space and time now how do we talk about this three dimensional space this is a space of our human experience and how do we talk about time again this process involves another mathematical thought process which in mathematics we again call space and now uh, as the mathematicians know uh, at one time until the uh, 19th century uh, numbers was considered the foundations of mathematics but they changed by the end of the 19th century and now we consider sets as the basic foundation of objects in mathematics what is a set is not defined but sets are used and our space in math, uh, in this math, uh, in mathematics is just a set with some possibly additional structures this space is just a thought a purely mental thought it is much more general than what we call space in physics and chemistry the uh, what we call in physics and chemistry the space is the three dimensional space of our physical experience that becomes only one example of what we call space in mathematics the space in physics and chemistry is modeled in various ways uh, on what we call space in mathematics 
Now, you recall Newton's famous book, Magnum Opus, in which he explained his theory of gravitation. It was called Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Natural philosophy was the word used in Newton's times for what we now call physics. The mathematical principles he mentioned are now called calculus. It is based on real numbers. Newton used real numbers, but did not know as we know them today. Uh, this foundational understanding is due to a deeply philosophical 19th century mathematician, Dedekind, and his famous paper in, uh, in 1881. With this understanding, the experience of time, for instance, is mathematically modeled on real numbers. You see, there is a difference between time and real numbers. But real numbers serve as a mathematical model for time. Again, the ingenious idea of Descartes to uh, present a three-dimensional space as triples of real numbers. So again, the real numbers are involved there, but there is more than one way of attaching uh, triples of real numbers to the points in the three-dimensional space of our uh, human experience. Uh, that's a, a really complicated discussion in itself. Uh, the, again, the notion of motion involves notions of velocity and acceleration. That's clearly part of mathematics. And they are again formulated using real numbers. Uh, okay, now on the other hand, Einstein's paper in 1905 on what we now call special relativity was called electrodynamics of moving bodies. That paper was written a decade before the existence of atoms, electrons, protons was theoretically confirmed or even formulated or even surmised. This paper led to a new understanding of what we now call space and time in physics. There is a three-dimensional space and time. Uh, the Einstein extended his 1905 understanding of the theory of special relativity in 1914 to a theory of general relativity in terms of a mathematically very sophisticated notion of a four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold. This notion was really formulated by Minkowski and other people. Uh, the, this notion was formulated on the pattern of n-dimensional Riemannian manifold, which was formulated by a great 19th century mathematician Riemann in 1854. Now, to a Riemannian manifold, there is associated the notion of curvature. It can be a, a scalar, a number, or it can be more complicated, a tensor in that, in that case. But the curvature of a Lorentzian manifold, that itself is a mathematical model of mass and gravity in physics. Now, there is another question actively discussed among the scientists. Did mathematics come first or physics chemistry come first? Of course, the stones, mountains, rivers existed long before mathematics came around. But stone, mountains, rivers, that is not called physics. Certainly, the mathematics was there long before even the words physics and chemistry were coined. To discuss the question meaningfully again, uh, we should make precise what we really mean by mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Assuming that we know matter, we clarified our 21st century understanding of, phys of physics and chemistry, that chemistry deals with matter in terms of atoms in their pure form, while physics deals with matter in motion. Now, one goal of this lecture is to explain the mathematical points, how atomic theory came around. We also clarified the mathematical thought categories, number and space. Now, mathematics itself can be defined as any human mental creation for attempting to explain its varied experiences. They could be from uh, material side or consciousness side, uh, anywhere, through the thought categories of number and space. 
That is what mathematics is. Again, I repeat, it's a human mental creation. It's a very much a human thing. Uh, I think the difference between animals and humans is that humans know the whole numbers, one, two, three, four, and much more. I think the animals at best know some up to 10, that some chimpanzees know up to 10. So it's a human mental creation for attempting to explain its varied experiences through the thought categories of number and space. So any attempt to explain a particular data, including the observational data about stars and planets in astronomy, or experimental material data of physics and chemistry obtained in a laboratory, involves mathematics. Mathematics also helps to predict new data. It may uh, come along, the mathematics may come along with the data, prior to the data, or after the data. As major examples, the ellipses certainly existed in geometry long before Kepler fitted them on planetary orbits. This Kepler's work was great that he actually saw something observational that was recorded for years and years, and he put exactly the ellipses uh, uh, on those planetary orbits and derived his famous three laws of planetary motion. Calculus came before the theory of gravitation. Riemannian geometry came before the general theory of relativity. On the other hand, the data about atoms, molecules, compounds, and mixtures came largely before the mathematical theory which explained, which explained it. More precisely and with hand, hindsight, we shall see that to explain the, and represent compounds and mixtures, we need a genuinely three-dimensional mathematics. I think this point is not made in the chemistry courses. Uh, to uh, represent something like methane, CH4, we need a three-dimensional model. But to explain what the atoms are, or the periodic table, just a two-dimensional mathematics, or even a one-dimensional mathematics, and that one-dimensional mathematics, by the way, as a clear analogy to the tricks used by Panin Drawer. So that was also like mathematics. And that, that one dimensional mathematics suffice for representing this atoms under periodic table. Let me tell you a joke. Feynman, it's not a joke. Feynman, the famous physicist, teased mathematicians that physicists would discover the mathematics they need in seven days. Lippmann Bears, a famous mathematician, he replied to Feynman, you are forgetting that the world was created in seven days. Meaning, God, if anything, is a mathematician, not a physicist. Jokes apart, but a very large part of what Einstein did, or what Feynman did, was actually mathematics. Professionally, unlike mathematicians, Einstein and Feynman were not restricted to a strict epsilon delta type of rigor needed for publishing papers in mathematics, mathematics journals. But they are required to have some experimental justification which suffices to publish papers in physics and chemistry journals. Now, I'm reminded of another famous issue, whether Valmiki wrote Ramayana in Rama's old age, or whether Rama merely enacted the drama which Valmiki wrote. The relationship of mathematics and science is like Ramayana and Rama. Mathematics is that poetry of science. In the words of the famous astronomer Jane Narlikar, he described this relationship as a jugalbandi of a singer and an instrumental musician. But in final analysis, it shows the unity of human thought. So this thought includes, to summarize, the material thought of physics and chemistry, uh, and also when consciousness begins to play a significant role, such as theorizing in biology, medicine, or social sciences, such as economics, sociology, politics, or mental sciences, uh, like... Uh, uh, Sir, hello. Hello. Yes. So there was uh, someone uh, just uh, started presenting his or her screen, so your slides have go off. So maybe 
you have to uh, present it again yeah so you have to present your slides again it has go off so everyone please refrain from presenting your screen other than the speaker yeah now now you see the slides uh no <laughs> yeah. you have to present yeah. it again we trouble with this again. Yeah. you have to present it again that's it no i uh, i see it on my screen yeah so uh, it is not associated with the google meet anymore you go to your google meet and present the slide again that will work you can go to the google meet on the same device and present your slide again Everybody can see it? No, no. <laughs> no, I can't see it. Sir, I do one thing. You wait. Okay. So I have your slides, so I can present it, and you can keep on sharing. That will be easy. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Yeah. So let me just try uh, presenting uh, from my end. Yeah. So where are you? Now, how do I make them? Uh, I can, I can, I can change it whenever you need it. I think you were. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Mathematics come first to physics. Where are you? And then we can do it. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. So maybe you were around twenty page or so, I think. You got one, yeah? You were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, now here. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. So this is the mathematics is that you got of uh, science of uh, you got one of mathematics and science. Papa. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Let me just recall. Uh, this division of sciences into physics, chemistry, biology is a relatively recent phenomenon which took place in the last three or four centuries. Now, uh, in the Indian knowledge system, the sciences came under one term, Vijnana. It was equivalent to natural philosophy. Uh, it, Vijnana actually uh, involved, involved more things than na uh, natural philosophy. But natural philosophy is included in Vijnana. And in Gita, from time to time, Krishna exhorts Arjuna to learn Jnana uh, along with Vijnana. Uh, or understand Jnan through Vijnan. At Harishinder Research Institute, uh, we had a logo, Jnanam Vijnan Saitam. So that, that was the meaning of that uh, logo. In the Greek knowledge tradition, the sciences came under the general term natural philosophy. 
Newton's magnum opus was called his mathematical principles. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Ah. Uh, now, each of the sciences have two parts, data of a particular nature and theory to explain the accumulated data and possibly make further predictions. The natural sciences, uh, that data is what we call matter, and uh, consciousness is not noticeably involved in these natural sciences. In the language of Gita, knowledge of matter is vidnyan, and knowledge of consciousness is nyan. <laughs> Please note that matter and consciousness are undefined terms here. These are human experiences, these are human thought categories. Now, mathematics is not usually included among the natural sciences. It is much more than natural science. In that is data is not material. Matter does not matter in mathematics. Data of mathematics is non-material or abstract. And it comes in the theory building in mathematical sciences. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, this modeling, as I explained, is in the two thought categories, mathematics itself, is the two thought, any human experience explained in terms of number and space thought categories. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ah. Now, there's uh, one more point here. In 20th century onwards, mathematicians have agreed to express mathematics in terms of sets. It is broadly divided into two parts. The mathematics that deals with finite sets and that which deals with infinite sets. And more subtly, the mathematics dealing with infinite sets can be further divided into two parts, that dealing with discrete sets and that dealing with continuous sets. In this lecture, we should not go uh, through the subtleties. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, discrete and continuous sets. In computer science, this distinction roughly corresponds to the notions of uh, uh, digital and analog. Uh, yes. The main example of discrete sets are all finite sets and the infinite set of natural numbers. This is a, this is a topological notion. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, in the main example of continuous sets is the real line. And a number system based on the real line is real numbers. The mathematics of finite sets is the, called combinatorics. In high schools, we study combinations and permutations. That is the beginning of combinatorics. In the 11th and 12th grade, we start studying calculus that is based on real numbers. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ah. Now, let's come back to the study of matter and the periodic table. Uh, start with a metal wire, of, which is eight feet long. And let's make a thought experiment. Suppose we cut the wire into two equal parts. Each part will be four feet long. Suppose we cut one of the parts again in two equal parts. Then the smaller part will be two feet long. And so on. This phrase we are used many times in mathematics. But what does this phrase mean? This is dealing with these problems of, about infinity. What do we model? How do we model this experience mathematically? On the one hand, we have uh, this wire and which we are going on cutting, and how it is mathematically modeled. Corresponding to the actual cutting of wire, we can, so the wire is uh, mathematically modeled on an interval, which is eight feet long on the real line. And if we go on cutting the corresponding interval, then we get intervals uh, eight, of eight feet long, four feet long, two feet long, one foot long, one half foot long, one quarter foot long, and so on. <laughs> the mathematical notion of real numbers is such that, in principle, uh, at, at this process can go on indefinitely. But now, whether does it actu actually occur uh, in physics? 
So the basic question is, can we do the same thing for the actual wire? So there are two logical possibilities. Yes, like interval, we can go on cutting the wire actually infinitely many times. There are many subtle issues just to say infinitely many times. Or more generally, this is a human conviction that matter comes in a continuous form. So this is one form of uh, mathematically modeling matter. And the mathematics dealing with that is called the continuum, uh, con continuum-based mathematics or continuum mechanics and so on. Or the other possibility is the process stops at some finite step. Now a mere thought cannot decide which alternative is right. Go ahead. Now, Indian knowledge system, the two traditions develop, and there is a corresponding thing also in the Greek knowledge system. What we call Vedanta took the first alternative, and it went on further arguing that the distinction of matter and non-matter, that is consciousness, itself is illusory. These are the jnana vadins. And the jnana vadins are like the Vaisheshikas, and Kanada was the, uh, the exponent of the, this Anuvada. He said that there is a smallest unit of matter. He called it Anu, which is the uh, Sanskrit word for atom. And now in the Greek knowledge tradition, roughly what Plato, Aristotle, that is Socrates, subscribed to first alternative. And Democritus, uh, took the alternative, second alternative, that there is the smallest uh, unit of uh, matter. He used the word atom, which literally means which cannot be divided further. Go ahead. Go ahead. As of today, in the 21st century, we have not come to a definite conclusion which alternative, which alternative between these two alternatives is true, quote unquote. Instead of settling the question in a definite way, we are wondering whether the question is posed correctly. For the issue is, the terms matter and consciousness are part of human experience, and they are not defined in terms of something else which is known. A multidisciplinary discipline called the consciousness studies, which involves natural sciences coupled with psychology, is being now vigorously pursued in some universities in the West. And it's called a consciousness problem. This is the main pro remaining problem for uh, natural science as well. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so let's now assume that we know what is matter. Uh, I'm repeating here. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the issue is how do we formulate these notions, this three-dimensional space or time, mathematically? Yeah, that is where the mathematics comes to the aid. Mathematics comes in theory building or modeling. Theory building is mathematical modeling. Now, we, as we observe above the number part and space part, these are the main parts of uh, uh, this is what mathematics is about. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Ah, now, for example, I have explained already that time, that experience is modeled on the real numbers. Now, uh, the matter, we usually uh, describe it in terms of weight, that weight is a real number or more for, formally, on the set of material objects, there is a function which takes values in the real numbers, which we call weight. And Descartes, he described the, say, a plane by a pair of real numbers. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, we come to varieties of matter, such as earth, water, air. The basic mathematical observation at the root of the modern science, modern atomic theory, is that when two different substances of weights W1 and W2 together form a third substance, its weight is just the addition of W1 and W2. 
if it is if that new substance is not just a simple mixture or technically if it is a, some chemical reaction between these uh, two substances has taken place then after normalization one observes that the two substances combine in simple integral proportions this is the law of definite integral proportions that was formulated by the chemist joseph proust with extensive experimentation during 1794 to 1804 and john dalton's who is credited with the atomic theory uh, he uh, came with that understanding too and that was formulated in 1803 go ahead go ahead now this law of definite proportions definite integral proportion there is no separate proof of this law which we can deduce from some other law but this law strongly suggests the atomic hypothesis that the alternative to the second alternative that matter has a basic unit that alternative may be true that is the atoms exist but if we go on dividing the two substances finitely many times the same integral proportions would continue to exist if you can go on dividing infinitely many times there would be an additional problem to explain what happens at the infinite stage we constantly use the law of definite integral proportions in chemistry to explain and predict chemical reactions note that the only numbers which occur in balancing chemical equations are integers okay go ahead go ahead further ah uh, now the second important notion is this avogadro's number this is a definite number and is the concept of mole so avogadro's number is this 6.02 times 10 to the 23 very large number it is known after the italian chemist avogadro and it is usually denoted by this fixed symbol na this arose in the study of ideal gases he formulated his hypothesis two ideal gases at the same pressure and temperature and having the equal volumes have the same number of atoms so you assume now the atoms exist and he is saying that the same definite number of atoms exist if in ideal gases if both the pressure volume and temperature they are uh, fixed quantities you know the ideal gas law pv equals nrt that r depends on the particular gas but that n is independent now if pv t are constant then except for this r this n is constant that is uh, n is uh, the number of moles that is under consideration and that was the uh, avogadro number ideal gases completely include is a list actually helium neon krypton xenon radon this is the ideal gas law coupled with the kinetic theory of gases and the, again it, this is something to be think uh, th thought about that avogadro predicted that it's a definite number but he did not say what the number was this is like the constructive part of mathematics and this actual constant was determined later by joseph rochmid after much experimentation i think after 30 40 years after avogadro's law was uh, avogadro this number was accepted and the input from the theory of electricity and magnetism that is very important in ascertaining uh, this uh, the exact uh, this avogadro number go ahead go ahead matter which we encounter in daily life consists of very largely mixtures and compounds but not atoms for example even animals know water but deep thinking and experimentation over two millennia was needed to decide that water is just h2o for you see neither hydrogen nor oxygen in daily life another example people knew salt for several thousand years but the knowledge that it is nacl that is one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine is the discovery only in the last 200 300 years 
However, it is interesting to note that the elements, gold, silver, iron, sulfur, mercury, which were known for over a thousand years, are atoms also in the modern sense. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finally, in 1800s, the chemists knew the atoms, most of which as we know them today. There's a nice list. I think just as we teach our young children, one, two, three, four, five, we may as well teach them hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, so on. So John Dalton formulated the modern atomic theory in 1803, which is a very far cry from the ancient theories of Kanaz and Democritus. At first, the chemists naturally ordered the atoms according to increasing weight. Because, you know, how do we understand matter? Through, uh, through weight. And so they just uh, ordered the atoms according to the weight. And it seemed natural to assume that if you assume uh, the atomic hypothesis, that the lightest atom, namely the hydrogen, if it has some particular weight, say W0, then all other atoms should have weight N W naught, where N is an integer, uh, N is a natural number, positive integer, and different atoms have different atomic weights. This is a natural to assume, uh, na natural to theorize, but this soon proved to be too naive, and it was disproved. And then uh, it was a question how to uh, uh, how to justify this order. That is partly where the periodic table comes in. Uh, but the, the second thing, that different atoms have different weights, that is uh, largely true. An extensive experimentation in the 19th century led to an understanding of about 100 atoms. Moreover, they experimentally observed a periodicity of period 8 in their chemical properties like melting points, boiling points, reactivity, ox oxidation, etc. So Mendeleev published a periodic table largely as we understand it today. I have something with, to talk to the chemists about this. Chemists talk about periodic table, but they do not talk about period. Uh, I, I shall mention this point at the end of my lecture. Now, it was only through the development of physics, experimentally by J.J. Thomson Rutherford around 1910, and then theoretically by Harold Bohr, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, that has resulted in quantum mechanical fundamental understanding and simplification of the atomic theory. And now this is the real scientific part now, the modern understanding of the atom. The mathematical model for an atom is that they are tiny balls. This is the mathematical model. What are their actual sizes? What is the radii of the of these balls? That will depend on the atom. But the there are 92 atoms, and this uh, radii can increase very fast. But the tiny ball modeling hydrogen hydrogen has the smallest radius. The hydrogen's atomic radius is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. The radii corresponding to other atoms are at most about 250, 300 times larger. So that multiplied by 10 to the minus 10 is not much different. So now inside that atom, there is, this is the discovery not of Thomson, but Rutherford, that there is a small nucleus. And it is, how it is mathematically modeled, is still smaller ball. And the radius of hydrogen's nucleus is about 10 to the minus 14 meters. To get a feeling for these numbers, just notice that the ratio of the radii of the whole atom to that of the nucleus is a very large number in ordinary terms. So uh, 10 to the minus 10 divided by 10 to the minus 14. So that is about, that is about 10 to the 4. So uh, it is like a ping, ball, ping pong ball in a playground of which is 200 feet wide. So this is, this is the nucleus. And the model is that in the nucleus there is protons and neutrons. And 
around them, the electrons move. Now, this was another issue. Uh, where in high school, one question came around that uh, in uh, my life, that uh, we ask, how do you define uh, Sajiv energy? Like matter and non-matter. So our teacher said, you know, something that moves is matter. And something that doesn't move, that is not matter. Now here is an issue that electrons move. Is that non-matter or matter? I think we can say that as matter now. And now this, the, the protons have positive electric charge and mathematically charge is another real value function on all matter. It's another real value function. Neutrons have zero electric charge and all atoms that are listed in the atomic table, their total electric charge is zero. And most matter that we daily encounter has zero total electric charge. But in an atom, electrons move around the nucleus. And this is a fantastic uh, hypothesis that they move only in seven or eight shells. They, and the electrons have a negative electric charge. And the charge of an electron is negative of the charge of a proton. So this is again mathematical model. These charges are, one is uh, attracting and the other is repelling. And so electrons and protons attract together, two electrons repel each other, two protons repel each other. Uh, and that's because of this property of the charge. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. This is a modern understanding of the atom. Go ahead. Now this is one very extremely interesting point. So outside this nucleus, there are only some electrons moving there. But this is, uh, yeah, this is like a ping pong ball in a 200 feet uh, wide uh, playground. But so what is there? That empty space is truly devoid of matter. There are no atoms in that empty space. It has, it has no matter, but it has potential energy. Incidentally, energy is one ontological terms at the basis of all natural science. It is usually a real number, but in general relativity, it becomes a tensor. And a grand, unusually unstated hypothesis of all natural science is that total energy is constant, but it can transform into different forms, potential, kinetic, chemical, frictional, etc. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is again very interesting to think about. Previous, previous slide, previous slide, previous. In the Indian knowledge tradition, Sankhya is the first theory of science. Kapila was the exponent of that. And he developed a system based on 25 tattvas. He called them tattvas. So, of which the fifth is Akasha, Prithvi, A, Vayu, Akash, and Tej. Tej is the energy. Uh, but he put Tej before Akash. And that Akash stands for previous, previous one. Previous. Previous. It stands for vacuum or empty space. And it is, it is remarkable that Sankhya thought of assuming Akash as a tattva. He was, you know, Kapila was building a theory. And for theory building, that hypothesizing that Akash should be understood as one of the tattva is very important. And that is what that empty, empty space uh, in, the, in the atom. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Huh. Now electrons move, and so they have a kinetic energy, which is a real number. It depends on which shell it is in. Now, this energy takes only up to seven or eight numerical values. 
it's not a continuous variation. It's just seven or eight variables. This is Planck's mind-boggling quantum hypothesis, which even Einstein could not completely grasp it. The different types of experiments performed at different times and places confirm the same numerical values. This is indeed the miracle of nature and a triumph of experimental technology. Go ahead. Uh, now, atomic number. Now, we now the atom is not only hydrogen, helium, uh, lithium, beryllium, but each atom also has this nucleus, which has protons, neutrons, and outside there are electrons. So, the atomic number of an atom is a natural number is number of protons in an atom which is the same as the number of electrons in an atom so that the total charge of an atom is zero thus mathematically atomic number is a function on the set of atoms which takes values in natural numbers two different atoms usually have different atomic numbers there is a very really subtle point i do not go into this in this regard, it is better than atomic weight. So first, the uh, 18th century, 19th century chemists, they uh, ordered the atoms according to atomic weight. But now, after understanding of electrons, protons, we just say the number of e electrons in an atom is its atomic number. And this function is a better than the atomic weight. But in mathematical terms, this number is not the complete invariant of an atom. It is the number of protons, number of neutrons, and what we call the, what we should, I should explain now, the electronic configuration is what mathematicians call a complete invariant of an atom. Uh, the electronic configuration, this is the deepest part of the structure of an atom, uh, a la chemistry, uh, and which you learn in a college level course in uh, or first year graduate level course in inorganic chemistry. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So there are 92 atoms with atomic numbers 1 to 92, which exist at room temperature. Atoms up to atomic number 118 have been constructed in a laboratory. But I believe that whether there is a theoretical upper bound on the atomic numbers is not known. I think Feynman thought it was 137 or something. But these, uh, between 118 and 137, these atoms have not been uh, discovered. And uh, whether that number is accepted as a theoretical upper bound, uh, I think it is. I, I do not know about that. OK, go ahead. Now this is the electronic configuration. Now in an atom, the electrons occupy different shells. And each shell, they occupy different subshells. Now, shell can be modeled as something like a, uh, like a sphere, but it's like a spherical ring. And the subshells are really some quadratic surfaces. So this is like ellipse being fitted on the planetary motion. So these quadratic surfaces being fitted on the subshells, and they are called orbitals in chemistry. Mathematically, they can be represented as certain quadratic ellipsoidal surfaces. The types of subshells are called S, P, D, F mostly, and there is also G. Now, in the first shell, there are at most two electrons in the S subshell. In the second shell, and that's it, that's the complete first shell. In the second shell, there are at most two electrons in the S subshell and six electrons in the P subshell. In the third, there are these uh, two electrons in S, S electrons in P, 
and 10 electrons in B subshell and so on. Hello? Go up. Yeah, similarly in the fourth, there are these 14 electrons in the F subshell and in the fifth subshell, uh, 18 electrons in the G subshell. Okay, go ahead. This much information is sufficient for understanding the electronic configuration of atoms in the periodic table, as there are specific rules. The Aufbau principle and the Hund's rule. The Hund's rule deals with the spin of the electron, uh, uh, a spin of these elementary particles. And Aufbau principle, Aufbau is the German word, is the construction principle. It explains how the electrons occupy higher and higher shells as atomic number increases. Okay. Now, the electrons in the outermost shell of an atom are called the valence electrons. And this plays the really fundamental role in chemical bonding of two and more atoms when they build molecules. The outbound principle implies that there are at most eight, eight uh, valence electrons. Uh, this I shall explain in the, in the pictures. And the, there are at most eight valence electrons and two in the S subshell and six in the P subshell. Although the electrons move in a three-dimensional physical space, it is remarkable that there is a two-dimensional mathematical representation of electronic configurations, where each shell is just represented by a circle, not some spherical ring. And the whole picture looks like concentric circles sitting in a plane, adding the extra features of SPDF electrons represented by dots on the circles by different colors of different colors on the uh, on the circles, uh, dots of different colors. We call this a shell representation of that atom. Go ahead. There's even, uh, but there is also even a one-dimensional representation of the electronic configuration. These are like words in an alphabet. These looks like words constructed out of the alphabet of atom names and numerals. And this is called a word representation. So these are the Panamian tricks that Panini used in his construction of Sanskrit grammar. Now the noble gases or the inert gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, they play an important role in all these representations. So there are these 92 atoms, you do not have to know uh, the, all these uh, electronic configurations for all of them. Once we know the shell representations and word representation or word representations of electronic configurations of the, the noble gases, then algorithmically one can construct the shell representations or word representations of electronic configurations of all known atoms. Now I, I shall I, I shall show those pictures shortly. Go ahead. Uh, further, further. Now about this period. Now we may define the period of an atom to be the number of electrons in the outermost shell. And as I said before, that there are at most eight electrons in the outermost shell. And two uh, if there, are, if there are eight electrons, there will be two S electrons and six P electrons. Since number is, this number is at most eight, we can now group together the atoms having the same period. The chemical significance of the period of an atom is that the atoms with the same period have some, some regularity in their chemical properties, like the boiling point, melting point, so on. The period of an atom also tells us 
which other atoms it will readily react with how will the molecules be formed how will the compounds be formed so this is uh, is very largely uh, determined by these valence electrons so there are actually two types of bonding <laughs> one is the ionic bonding and the other is the uh, general bonding the general bonding was developed by linus pauli that was his really ground breaking work but this ionic bonding can be uh, explained more simply that uh, an atom with period k that is k valence electrons it bonds with atoms with l valence electrons if k plus l is 8 so this is a very simple rule this determines the ionic bonding okay further for example sodium has period 1 uh, i think i i think i have a picture of that sodium and chlorine has period 7 see the shell representations so they can combine to form a compound sodium chloride uh, sodium chloride so that is nacl which we commonly call salt and there is another form of the more general covalent bonding where the number 8 again plays an important role but it is i, I will not go into that at this point in particular the noble gases have period 8 so noble gases are inert gases and they have this eight valence electrons so the outer shell is completely filled so they do not react with any other atoms uh, so we may say that the period of the periodic table is eight and which the uh, chemists don't talk about they they don't talk about the period they do talk about the period but their period is completely different uh, but not this intrinsic period so oh, yeah. so i end this lecture by mentioning an issue about different terminologies the chemists refer to a row in the periodic table ala mendeli i think you have seen this table i shall show you this picture again uh, they call the row a period and column a group now certainly not a group in the mathematical sense uh and this they call the row a period but but for mathematicians a period of any system should be an integral multiple of a fixed real number for example the function sin x is called periodic with periods which are integral multiples of 2 pi or the function sin 2 pi x is periodic periods or the integers minus 2 minus 1 0 1 2 etc so my request for the chemists try to define the period of a, of the periodic table requiring that the period should be a natural number <laughs> okay so this is my request uh go ahead go ahead ah uh. yeah uh, i have to consult a uh, professor of chemistry mega bevere in pune uh, she answered my queries on this period of time okay oh, okay now, now the pictures and now this is the period of time uh, how many of you have seen this period of time you probably have seen this can people has, has, has everybody seen it <laughs> i think yes sir uh, yes sir now you do you understand the periodic table okay so uh, show this first thing now uh, there is this organization uh, national institute of stat uh, standards and standards and uh technology 
It, it used to be called uh, National, uh, National Institute of Standards uh, in the United States. So you see this periodic table is uh, goes on, they, goes on, it has to be confirmed, reconfirmed again and again as the time passes. And this is the, uh, I think this is the table which is now accepted, this is one official table as of 20, 2020. Uh, it can change a little bit afterwards and there are many uh, other data that is beyond there, the data is all included here. So these are all the atoms, not only 92 atoms, but these 118 atoms, uh, which are made of only one day. So here you know, hydrogen is a kind of, uh, uh, let me see that, let me say the periodic table, periodic table, slide before. Uh, hydrogen and helium, these are special elements. There are only one electron uh, and the helium has uh, two electrons. Uh, it's like in mathematics also, we see this uh, pattern, something special about number one, space, something special about number two. From number three onwards, some regularity comes in and so on. Uh, so, uh, so these rows, uh, the, the, uh, chemists call periods, and these uh, columns they call groups. Now, let me tell you that Mendeleev's table is one of the ta one of the periodic tables. Even contemporaries of Mendeleev had some other representations. Which, are, which were periodic tables. There was one periodic table based on a cylinder rather than the penal uh, graph. And there are still periodic tables which are uh, proposed from time to time. So just to say period of a Mendeleev periodic table to be uh, the row of the periodic, Mendeleev periodic table, uh, this is not the intrinsic definition of a period. So that was my uh, observation before. And uh, you can see some of these, uh, many of the atoms we have heard about, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, neon, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, sil silicon is the, one of the main atoms. You know, there is Silicon Valley in the United States. Uh, uh, yeah, and so on. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, now so let me tell you the shell and the electronic configuration. So, so uh, for each atom, you can have this two-dimensional picture. This is the, the innermost circle is the nucleus. Now I think here is, yeah, this is a picture for lithium. So in the first shell, there are two electrons. And there are also, these two electrons are S electrons. And in the second shell, there is only one electron. And that's again an uh, S, uh, S electron. Go ahead. Go ahead. So this is different. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, this is this outbound principle. So in the outbound principle, the first integer, this is the shell number. And in each shell, now in the first shell, there are only S. In the second shell, there are only S and P. In the third shell, there are S, P, D, and S, P, D, F, and so on. Then as the atomic number increases, we have to put more and more electrons uh, in, the, in the atom. Now, how they are put, 
So this is this our power principle. So first you do the one S, then you do two S, and then you go back, and then do two P, then three S. Uh, now after after three S, there is three P, four S. That much is standard now. But after after four S. Uh, after four is, it's not five s. After four s, it goes to three d. So the third shell starts filling with d type of electrons. Then again in the fourth shell there will be p electrons. Now if the shell is five, then there is a larger and larger discrepancy here. After five s, there is no five p, but it is after that 4D and then 5P and so on. So this is the power principle. And that uh, Hund's rule, this is the, uh, this is about spin. And you see there was a uh, period in mid 1940s, 50s, uh, for each of these constructions, there was a Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, you see this, this work is uh, and this work is certainly mathematical, uh, but it needed an experimental verification, and that experimental verification involves uh, mainly compounds, not just atoms. Uh, and so that data uh, about compounds is being pu published in chemical journals. And looking at that data, you have to guess that this is the uh, construction principle for the atom. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and again, these are the, the these are the actual uh, in chemistry books. They draw these ellipsoidal surfaces. And they call it uh, orbitals. Uh, yeah. Uh, these are how the orbitals look like. Okay, go ahead. Now carbon. Now I also explained this uh, uh, yeah, the word representation. So word representation of the electronic configuration is just uh, 1 S2, 2 S2, 2p2 for carbon. So it says in the first shell there are two s electrons. In the second shell there are two s electrons and two p electrons. In the second shell there can be at most uh, eight electrons. So there are really possibility of uh, putting uh, six more electrons here. Now this. Carbon is a marvelous element that it, it forms bonds with many, many atoms. And there is a, the, uh, what we call organic chemistry that is really just the uh, compounds of carbon. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Ah, inert, inert gases is the last column of the periodic table. Yeah, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. Now, uh, now, previous one, previous one, and the next, next, go up, and this one. No, previous one. And now, this representation, you see, they, they do not write down the uh, first shell and the second shell. So, when it is not written, the, these are the Paninian tricks. <laughs> it is to be understood that the uh, neon, neon is a inert gas. So, the neon's electronic configuration comes before. 
and then how the third shell uh, gets filled. And then, uh, then say krypton. So there are then there are uh, there is argon first. So first the word representation of the argon followed by this string. Uh, there are 10 D electrons in the third shell, two S electrons in the fourth shell, and six P electrons in the fourth shell, and so on. So this is the this is the structure. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I, I should change some of these pictures. But this is yeah, the, this person who drew these pictures, he just drew the first ten atoms. Uh, so these are the so just by looking at the third column, we know all about that particular atom. Okay. Okay, I think this is enough for me <laughs> at the moment.